This episode is brought to you by Ridge Wallet. Hey, Wisecrack, Michael here. Still in the same room in the same house. I haven't really left since March and I'm recording another video all alone in this room in front of the same goddamn book. Sorry about that, folks. Now, I'm very eager to grab a drink with friends without the specter of death haunting me. And I'm sure you are too, as citizens crave basic social interaction and the economy craves our spending. Technologies and policies designed to prevent the spread of coronavirus are popping up everywhere. From boring but well-established proven methods like hand washing, social distancing, and wearing a mask over your mouth and nose, to newer approaches like smartphone-based GPS tracing and thermal imaging cameras repurposed to check for fevers, governments and businesses are ready to try anything that will get our terrified asses off the couch and into the nation's cubicles and inexplicably sticky diner booths. Now, while we are 100% ready to luxuriate in the Taco Bell dine-in experience, we wouldn't be wisecrack if we didn't ask the tough questions, like, to what extent are newer policies surrounding COVID-19 keeping us safe from infection? And still harder to think about, are they even supposed to? Welcome to this Wisecrack edition on Security Theater. But before we continue, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Ridge Wallet. The Ridge Wallet is a light, sleek, and industrial wallet designed to last you a lifetime. Each wallet is made with RFID blocking technology, which protects you from digital pickpockets. The durable metal also means each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. So this could be the last wallet you ever buy. It's perfect if you don't want to carry around a bulky old leather lump in your pocket, but still want to maximize the amount of cards you carry. It holds up to 12 cards and still has room for cash. The Ridge team is so confident that you will like it that if you don't and send it back within 45 days, you will receive a full refund. Grab your own Ridge wallet today by going to ridge.com slash wisecrack and use promo code wisecrack to get 10% off. You will get free worldwide shipping and returns, so click the link in the description to get one today. Now, back to the show. To be clear, we're not here to peddle conspiracy theories. Masks and social distancing work to dramatically reduce the spread of COVID-19. Cover your nose, kids. But as we're about to find out, whether you're trying to manage viruses or terrorism, there's more to the seemingly basic concept of security than you might expect. If you're in a state that has tried reopening restaurants and bars, or even if you've hopped on a plane, you might have encountered new procedures meant to make us feel safe. These range from restaurants and bars operating at diminished capacity to states like New York only allowing outdoor dining to businesses touting extra cleaning procedures to buildings and some airports testing out using thermal scanners to identify people running potentially COVID-induced fevers. But not all strategies are equal. Some are questionably effective at best and potentially harmful at worst. As Evan Selinger and Brenda Leung put it in a recent article, installing thermal scanning as part of a back to work process might create a false sense of security that convinces some to prematurely return to their jobs and emboldens others to relax more effective strategies, such as social distancing and responsible contact tracing efforts. A quick definition, contact tracing is the practice of tracking down people who were exposed to another sick person in order to proactively treat or isolate them and contain the spread of the disease. Selinger and Leung claim that thermal scanning and other fancy looking quick fixes are not true security. Rather, they're what privacy expert Bruce Schneier has famously called security theater, or security measures that make people feel more secure without doing anything to actually improve their security. Think, for instance, of the little yard signs that security companies plant in front lawns to let passersby know that the designated house is protected by an alarm. Now, seeing that placard as you come home every day may help you sleep better at night, which is arguably a good thing in and of itself. But it's important to remember that the sign itself cannot actually detect or prevent a break-in or slow it down once it has started. When an angry Balrog comes to steal your PlayStation, that little piece of metal on a stick is not going to pull a Gandalf so you and your uninsured gadgets can escape out the back door. You shall not pass! Maybe the sign deters people, or maybe it just advertises to thieves that they need to be extra careful when robbing you. As convenient as technologies like remote temperature taking and real-time phone-enabled contact tracing would be, Selinger and Leung point out that, so far, they just don't cut the proverbial mustard. Silicon Valley loves to tote glitzy new GPS-backed ways to track the spread of disease. But as reported in Wired, many health officials don't consider contact tracing programs that use smartphone location data to be as effective as traditional human-based contact tracing programs. Then there's temperature checks and thermal imaging. 
Airlines pushed in May for temperature checks at airports. Dr. Martin Citron, the CDC's Director of Global Mitigation and Quarantine, called the idea a poorly designed control and detection strategy, and an earlier screening by the CDC of over 30,000 passengers did not catch a single COVID-19 case, even though some of the same passengers later tested positive for the virus. And per the Washington Post, thermal imaging cameras have not demonstrated the ability to detect internal body temperature with the accuracy of more basic thermometers. In other words, organizations around the country are spending a lot of money to install technologies that apparently do not work for their stated purposes of protecting people from infection. But why? While in casual conversation we might understand the word security to mean the process of keeping people safe, Schneier contends in his book Beyond Fear, thinking sensibly about security in an uncertain world, that it's not nearly that straightforward. According to him, what we call security is actually a complex interplay between the differing agendas of the various individuals and organizations invested in a given situation, what he calls the players. A given security policy emerges out of the negotiations between these players, influenced by the relative levels of power between them, resulting in a program that serves the interest of the most powerful players first and foremost, and may or may not actually increase safety for end users as an almost secondary goal. As an example, Schneier cites the fact that in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, tweezers and nail files were banned on planes, while some actually combustible materials like lighters were allowed through. This, according to Schneier, was the result of the relative influence of the tobacco lobby on the government's decision-making process. One player pressuring another. Big Tweezer, unfortunately, didn't have the clout to stay off the TSA sh list. Security theater happens when the more powerful players involved are focused on their own self-interest, to the detriment of the holistic security of the system they participate in. From these circumstances, policies can emerge that create the appearance of doing something without actually making people safer. Still, players can find such systems very attractive. Schneier claims offering security theater can improve market share just as much as offering actual security, and it is significantly cheaper to provide. He also notes that most people are comforted by action, whether good or bad. The most infamous example of such a system is, again, the post-9-11 airport security system. In the wake of the attacks, the most powerful players involved had an overriding political and economic agenda to get people flying again, as soon as possible which meant that they had to make the average citizen feel safe enough to do so. The resulting airport security theater satisfied the government's need to implement a public-facing response to terror, as well as the airline's need for your sweaty pocket cash. In other words, said system provides the biggest players with what they want, while not necessarily making flying significantly safer. To put it bluntly, from this point of view, the federal government employs many thousands of TSA agents and purchases an equal number of hideous blue shirt and black pants combos to make the average citizen feel safe enough to fly, even though the process of taking off your shoes, downing your entire water bottle, and one ill-considered swig, and having a tired middle-aged man examine your junk via a body scanner probably doesn't make you that much safer. Consider, for instance, the fact that in one nationwide test of the system conducted by Homeland Security in 2015, undercover agents were able to smuggle mock explosives and weapons through security checkpoints a whopping 95% of the time. And you thought your last annual review went bad. Unfortunately, many of the criticisms applied to our handling of airport security can be applied to some, though not all, of our society's current attempts to address the problem of coronavirus. Building off of Schneier's framework, law professor and privacy expert Peter Swire has gone so far as to claim that we may be facing a kind of public health theater on par with the security theater installed in the wake of 9-11. Citing the temptation for government agencies to resort to unreliable phone location tracking as the lazy man's approach to contact tracing, Swire claims that government officials have great incentives to show the public they are doing something, anything to address the crisis. However, Swire goes on to note that, absent an empirical showing of accuracy and actionability that does not exist to date, calls for such location tracking quite possibly are security theater rather than actual security. This description ties in neatly with Schneier's framework. In our current moment, the players involved in formulating our collective policy for handling coronavirus include governments at the national, state, and local levels, and businesses ranging in size from giant corporations to your local pizza joint. These players, who have varying levels of power, bring to the table many different agendas. In the case of governments, to be seen taking action, effective or not, and to safeguard a struggling economy. And in the case of businesses, to attract enough customers to turn a profit, or at least keep operations going. 
Perhaps there is no better example of health security theater than the quickly maligned reopening plans of AMC theaters for July. As the LA Times noted, the challenge is not just reopening, it's getting people comfortable enough to show up. So the company sought to assuage fears by reducing capacity and spending millions of dollars on sanitation equipment. While all of those things can reduce the spread of the virus, the policy that is most effective at keeping people safe wasn't on the docket, wearing masks. While the company would require employees to wear them, they would not universally require patrons to. That was deemed political which is a nice way of saying not good for business, although the company reversed course after backlash and stated they would require masks. If I can make a somewhat unscientific analogy, the sanitation equipment is like that dude at the frat party who wanted to ride a Razor scooter off of a roof telling you, chill bro, I'll wear a helmet. And here our imaginary bro reveals a basic danger of security theater, half measures that make you feel safer about doing something incredibly dumb. Importantly, we're not here to malign safety measures like wearing helmets or doing temperature checks. These things are fine so long as they don't give people a false sense of security as they careen headfirst into a traumatic brain injury, or so long as they don't pull money and other resources from more impactful safety measures. After all, you don't want to spend all your money on seatbelts for a car known to burst into flames. Now, AMC's scrapped mask policy is not unique. As restaurants and bars tout menu cleaning and waiters clad in PPE, many are not requiring patrons to wear masks as they amble past other diners. To be fair, some businesses are just trying to do the right thing, keeping their employees and customers safe while trying to limit layoffs. But as Schneier observed in the wake of 9-11, self-interest is a powerful force, even in the midst of a national emergency. If the best science says that the best way to stay safe is to stay home and to avoid the Cheesecake Factory, quite literally like the plague, it is in the restaurant player's best interest to ignore that data as much as possible. Instead, they might implement relatively less costly security theater measures that give people enough confidence to drown their sorrows in avocado egg rolls. Jokes aside, their recent tragic spikes in infection rates in Arizona, Texas, Florida, and California demonstrate how security theater can create a gap between the perception of safety and an unsafe reality. At its best, security theater can be a useful part of a functioning society, deterring lesser threats while providing us some day-to-day -day peace of mind. At its worst, though, as a byproduct of big players' desire for a swift return to normalcy, it can encourage average people to lower their defenses before it's really safe to do so, with devastating consequences. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Are some of the safety measures we see just for show, or is everyone just scrambling to do the right thing? Let us know in the comments, and be sure to subscribe and ring that bell. Big thanks to our patrons for supporting our podcast and the channel, and as always, thanks for watching. Later.